There is a magical, mystical play called Shovel Option that's gotten more and more popular with each passing season in the NFL. This play, in some form or variation, has been around since at least the 60s, and it's been iterated on and tweaked over and over for decades, to the point that almost everyone in the league has tried to run their own version of it. But what's interesting about this play is that it pretty much only works for one team. They've done studies, you know, 60% of the time, it works every time. Actually, to be more accurate, 20% of the time, it works every time. Unless you're the Chiefs. When Kansas City runs the power option shovel, it scores. It scores a lot, actually. When almost everyone else in the league runs it, though, it is by far the worst play in football. And yes, I am directing this at you, Zach Taylor. Please stop calling it. Call literally anything else. I am begging you at this point. But anyway, back to my point. Today, I'm going to go over the history of the power option shovel. I'm going to talk about why it is the way that it is today with all of its different twists and variations and, you know, modern tweaks, so to speak. And also, schematically, I'm going to go over what the Chiefs do differently than everybody else so that they can actually make this play work and not be, you know, total shit. Thank you to Upside for sponsoring this week's show, by the way. If you want to save money on everyday purchases, you can check them out in the link in the description below. But more on them later. For now, go grab yourself a comfy chair. Go grab yourself your favorite drink because this is going to be a long, meaty episode about football history and ridiculously nuanced low red zone tape. Uh, this is going to be an interesting one. Let's get after it. Brian, I'm going to be honest with you. That smells like pure gasoline. First things first, there's a common misconception that the goal line shovel pass is the Chiefs' signature play or that it's the quote-unquote Travis Kelsey play or whatever, but that could not be further from the truth. The Chiefs did not invent the play, they're just better at it than everybody else. Going back through all the film and the data that I have available to me, I found examples of other teams running it almost every year for the past 10 seasons, and some of them even succeeding at it. For instance, going all the way back to 2016, where both Kyle Shanahan and Sean Payton ran it against each other in the same game in week three of that year. And even the week before that, the Cowboys ran it with Dak Prescott in his rookie year, and the Buccaneers also busted it out in Jameis Winston's very first career start in Tampa in week one of 2015. Believe it or not, when we started crowdsourcing examples of this play on Twitter last week, one eagle-eyed Steelers fan even pointed out that Pittsburgh once ran it with Heath Miller a full decade ago now during the 2013 season. Kansas City, under Andy Reid, meanwhile, would not call their first shovel pass in a goal line situation for several more years until the very last game of 2018, which was Patrick Mahomes' first year as a starter. It was likely already in the playbook, of course, that entire time. They just never actually called it in that specific situation until Mahomes was the guy. From there, the Chiefs would, of course, go on to call this play the most out of any team by a wide margin over the next four years. So I guess you could argue that they made the play famous, so to speak, but they certainly were not the first to run it. In fact, if we want to be super technical about it, we can trace the origins of this play all the way back to the 1960s Houston Cougars under then head coach Bill Yeoman, who was the patron saint of God's favorite offense, the split back veer. Now, I want you to remember the key elements of this veer option play because they're roughly the same thing as the modern day shovel option that everybody knows and loves, but just in a different order. Element number one, the dive key. The quarterback's gonna open up towards the unblocked end man on the line of scrimmage. And if that unblocked man does not collapse down on the dive immediately, then the quarterback will give the ball and this run will hit up inside for a decent gain behind that double team. However, if the edge does crash down within the first two steps of the play, then element number two is that the quarterback will keep the ball and then he'll keep going to the edge to read the next furthest man outside as if it's a normal option play. And then they'll try to get that second unblocked defender into a two on one out in space. If you ever watched Georgia Tech or Army run this over the last hundred years or so, or if you've ever seen any rugby game ever, this should be a pretty familiar concept to you. Hell, Andy Reid himself has run both option plays and shovel option plays out of split back formation even within just the last 15 years, including during that famous Monday Night Massacre of Washington by Michael Vick when he was still in Philly, and even as recently as just last season, Reid also showed a split back look pre-snap and then motioned out of it, sort of as an homage to his past. Now, back to the origin story, fast forward a couple of decades later after the dominance of the Veer in the 60s and 70s, as the shotgun formation started to become more and more popular throughout the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, 
You had coaches that wanted to create the same conflicts in a defense that the Veer presented, but they wanted to do it from the gun, and that then necessitated the start of the inverted Veer. Oddly enough, according to Chris Brown of Smart Football, who's one of the best people in this business, the first instances that we can find of the inverted veer making its way into college football was with Andy Dalton, of all people, when he was still at TCU in 2009. And then shortly after that, Cam Newton was able to rumble his way to a Heisman Trophy by running the inverted veer at Auburn. In the NFL, you can still see echoes of the inverted veer of that era, even though it's not quite the same thing in the modern Ravens run game where Lamar Jackson is going to be the dive player up the middle in a lot of situations, while the running backs and receivers are going to be the threats to hit the edges in the same manner as, say, a pitchman would be in the original inverted veer option. Again, Greg Roman's schemes are not entirely the same thing, but they do share a lot of similar elements. Even before the inverted veer showed up though, as offenses over time twisted and morphed the increasingly popular single back shotgun spread, and of course all the run concepts that came with that, like shotgun power, at some point they all made an entirely new concept that Kansas State's head coach at the time, Bill Snyder, among others, like to call the power option shovel. Based on my research, I don't know exactly when this happened, but it at least happened by the early 2000s, if not sooner. If the veer and the inverted veer are the distant second cousins of what we see at the goal line in today's NFL, the power option shovel is the living flesh and blood. You see either direct copies of this play or variations of this play all over the league right now, even with the Chiefs themselves, of course, and you can still see all of the elements that made the veer and the inverted veer so dominant for so many decades. There's still the quarterback threatening the dive up the middle while reading the mesh point. There's also the fast option in the flat that the quarterback can get the ball out to for an easy score if they think they have a numbers advantage out there. And that would be like the modern equivalent of an outside pitch man in an option scheme. But you also have the backside shovel, which is the star of the show, so to speak. And if that's blocked well at the point of attack, and if the defense overplays the threats to the edge, that receiver on the shovel should basically be able to walk into the end zone behind that pulling guard as if he's a running back on a normal power run. That's the goal here, essentially. It's like running power, but without actually running power. Bill Yeoman, Bill Snyder, Paul Johnson, and every Service Academy coach in history has their DNA in this play, and it's gorgeously designed. But here's the problem. For 31 out of 32 teams in this league, it almost never works against modern defenses. And the obvious question there is, why is that? Why does this play not work most of the time, even though it looks like it should work all the time? Well, it's because at an individual level, the margin for error for any offense running it is razor thin because there are no fewer than three different players in any given defensive front that can basically shut down this design all by themselves. There's the playside edge defender, the playside defensive tackle, and the backside defensive tackle. All of them individually can completely wreck this play on their own, even if everybody else on the defense gets beat. Let's go one by one. First up, the playside edge. We'll use this play that I referenced earlier as an example because it actually starts in that split back formation that enabled the Veer to dominate all those decades ago. Now, ironically, this is one of the times that this play actually failed for Kansas City. And the reason that it failed is, again, because of that playside edge, Joey Bosa. Now, the Chiefs are under center here, so it's not quite the same thing as the power option shovel because you can't really run that without being in the shotgun. But in order to still leave Bosa unblocked to try to bait him up the field, just like a normal shotgun option play would have, they simulate Mahomes moving to his right as if it's a sprint right option play. So again, they're trying to draw Bosa upfield and take him out of the play without having to actually allocate a blocker for him so that the pulling guard here can then wrap around and handle the linebacker at the point of attack, which will then open up a lane for the shovel pass. However, unfortunately for KC here, if that playside edge stays disciplined and doesn't fly all the way up the field, and instead they wait for that shovel and crash down behind the puller and get in on the tackle, it becomes much, much harder for that receiver to then fight through contact and score. So that edge player is key if they can just stay disciplined as the unblocked man and not get too aggressive. But you might also have noticed that the playside defensive tackle from the one technique position also got in on this hit. And that player, as I mentioned before, is also a big part of stopping this concept. If you look around the league at a lot of the times that this play or plays like it failed, 
it's because the playside nose tackle or the playside three technique or four eye or whatever alignment they're in, it's because that playside interior defensive lineman was able to feel the block trying to wash them down and they were then able to fight back over the top of that block and rally to the ball. It's the exact same technique that defensive tackles are taught to play against a normal power run. If they read a down block from one side, especially as a nose tackle, and they're not getting double teamed, guess what? That means that they're probably putting a pulling blocker behind that down block, and that's where the ball is going. So they got to fight back over the top of that block and do what a lot of defensive line coaches refer to as stealing back a gap. It's the same thing on every single shovel pass, because again, those are designed to replicate power run schemes. You feel the down block, there's no double team, so you get over the top of it and you help make the tackle with the edge player that's also crashing down inside. Over and over again, I'm not kidding, it is literally the same shit. And those same rules apply to the third main defensive player that typically stops this concept, the backside defensive tackle, because they also will be playing this concept exactly the same way as if it were a power run being run away from their side. So from a read and a technique perspective, whether they're a backside nose tackle or a backside three technique or a four eye or whatever, it doesn't even matter. This is not anything that they haven't done before. Let's look at this failed fourth and two opportunity by the Bengals offense back in week five, which ironically is the play that inspired me to make this episode in the first place because I hate it just that much. Once the Bengals are done motioning into their empty set, the Ravens already know this play is coming because you have a bunch to the boundary, there's one receiver tight to the core that's off the line of scrimmage on the other side, they're in empty, and this look just screams shovel pass off a fake sprint out because that's just what teams run out of this kind of formation these days. There's really no originality here, so the Ravens are calling it out pre-snap and they definitely know it's coming. On the end zone angle though, what I mainly want to point out is how the interior defensive linemen play this, especially Calais Campbell who's the backside three technique. Again, they know what the likely blocking scheme is here, especially with the different stances of the two guards, basically holding up a neon sign that points out who's down blocking and who's pulling. It's kind of hard not to see what's coming here. The left guard will be blocking down on the one technique. The center will not be helping on that one technique at all because he has to get out of there and cover a lot of ground to do what most offensive line coaches consider the hardest block in football, which is a back block all the way on a backside three technique, let alone when that three technique is, you know, Calais freaking Campbell. And then of course the right guard, who's damn near standing straight up, will be pulling around to try to be the lead blocker for the receiver on the shovel pass. As the one technique nose tackle slashes inside and penetrates, because he knows he can, because there's not gonna be a double team, you can see Campbell play this back block very patiently because of that pre-snap read. He knew that he just had to feel for that block and then step into it to pressure it with his near foot and near shoulder, like he's been taught since Pop Warner. And from there, since he's not trapped upfield by any sort of over-aggressive penetration, you know, he didn't try to shoot that gap and then get pinned by the back block, he could fight back over the top of that block and then meet the receiver at the catch point to help disrupt the play. Not to beat a dead horse, but once again, this is the exact same read and technique for how he would try to stop a power run. This just happens to be a pass play instead. I know that there was a lot of discussion about Lyle Collins and if he missed an assignment on this play because you saw the coaches talking to him on the broadcast after it failed, but he actually did his job here. His only role is to just step inside and help the center land that back block, and then he has to get his eyes outside to help against the backside defensive end if they happen to beat the tight end. He is not supposed to get out on the second level. He is not supposed to be blocking Marcus Peters. None of that is his job. And if you wanna know how I know that, it's because I've literally seen and charted almost 50 fucking reps of this play over the last two and a half seasons, and not once, not one time has the backside tackle been responsible for getting up to the second level to block a DB. That is just not how this play is designed, so please do not blame Lyle Collins for it. Truthfully, if you want to blame anybody, blame Zach Taylor, because he insisted on calling this play in the first place, even though it has a monumentally high failure rate to begin with. Since the start of the 2020 season, 49 shovel passes have been attempted inside the five yard line, and there have only been 14 touchdowns scored on those attempts, which is a touchdown success rate of roughly 28.6%. Six of those 14 touchdowns alone are from the Chiefs, so one team has 42% of all touchdowns on this play, and KC's own touchdown success rate is also about 42% on their own attempts. 
That by itself is an insane stat. But here's the kicker. For the rest of the league combined, this play over the last two and a half years has only worked 22.9% of the time. When you factor in that across all other types of passing plays inside the five, their total touchdown success rate is roughly 36%. Statistically speaking, you're actually lowering your chances of scoring if you call one of these shovel pass concepts instead of, and I'm not even exaggerating here, literally any other type of passing play. If you are a coach and you call this, you are actively making your offense worse. That is, you know, unless you're Andy Reid. In that case, you're probably fine. All right, so that is an abbreviated history of the play and how it's had kind of a renaissance in the NFL over the last six to seven years. And also that's why, despite that renaissance, it's still kind of a bad play call that doesn't really work that often. But you might be asking yourself, okay, well, if it's a bad play call, what are the Chiefs doing that's so different? How were they able to take an objectively bad play call and make it successful? Well, I'm gonna show you, but first things first, I wanna note that making these types of videos is oddly very expensive. They take a lot of hours to put together. This one's probably about two weeks worth of work. And I wouldn't be able to do these kind of historical deep dives and really nitty gritty tape studies without sponsors like Upside supporting me. Upside is a completely free way for you to save money on everyday purchases like gas, groceries, or even dining out. All of those things are super expensive these days, obviously, and it takes me over $80 just to fill up my gas tank at this point, so that sucks. But Upside can help to at least make it hurt a little bit less. All you have to do on the app is claim an offer for whatever you're gonna buy, check in at that business, pay as you normally do with your credit or debit card, and then you're gonna get cash back just for going to that business to buy something that you were already gonna buy. So it's really easy to use and save money with, and if you wanna try it for yourself, you can download and use the app totally for free, and with promo code FILMROOM, you'll get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thank you again to Upside for helping to make this show possible, and with that, let's take a closer look at the sheer evil genius that is Andy Reid. When looking at the Chiefs offense and why they're more successful at this type of play than everybody else, what you first need to understand is that they don't run it like everyone else. Across the entire league over the last three seasons, 80% of all goal line shovel passes have come from shotgun, like I alluded to earlier, but for the Chiefs individually, only 57% of their attempts have been from the gun. They've mixed in a lot more under center looks than every other team, and their success rate from under center has also been much higher than their success rate from the gun at a whopping 50%. Half of their shovel pass touchdowns have come from under center on just six attempts, and that's a big factor in why they've been able to make it work. Additionally, from these under center looks where Mahomes is either faking a sprint out or faking a bootleg type of play, those types of actions that involve more dynamic movement with the quarterback also tend to influence defenses a lot more than just faking a normal handoff from the gun. You can look at this play against the Ravens from the 2020 season as an example. Watch how Coach Reed combined the threat of speed to the edge with dynamic movement from Mahomes, as well as just a lot more convincing of a deception in order to create the lane for the underhanded shovel pass to hit inside. With Tyreek Hill lined up in the backfield and then going out to the flat, obviously the defense is keying in on that as the intended design of the play, or at least what they think the intended design is, but the bootleg of Mahomes combined with a little bit of chip help from the fullback that all gives the impression that Patrick is supposed to be out in space with a lead blocker trying to hit Hill in the flat. That's what everyone on this defense believes is going to happen. The edge thinks he's won here. He truly trusts that he just beat the fullback and that he's not intentionally being drawn up the field. So he takes himself out of the play pretty much willingly. And then additionally to that, you've got two safeties and a linebacker all convinced that Tyreek is getting the ball out in the flat because to them, why else would you line him up in the backfield unless he was the intended target? That's how a defense generally thinks about these things, you know, that if something's off in the alignment, it's for a reason. So they all get fooled there as well. Plus, on top of that, look at the offensive line here. There's no pull from the backside guard. They double team the nose tackle instead. So that nose is not trying that hard to fight back over the top and get front side to take down the receiver. So that helps to seal off that side of the running lane. And then on the front side of the lane, the play side guard and play side tackle execute a gorgeous double team on the three technique so that they can also bury him and seal him out 
which then allows the tackle to get up to the second level and seal out the other side of the running lane. So by the time Mahomes gets his eyes around to the unblocked edge rusher and then flips the ball to the fullback, there is an incredibly wide open lane for him to run through. Every single individual element that we talked about earlier that can and will ruin this play, they were all accounted for. The edge was baited into flying up the field, the playside interior defensive lineman was basically banished to the shadow realm, the backside interior player was taken out with a double team, and then everyone else that was left over was too busy chasing the most convincing decoy in the NFL. That is why this play, and all of their different variations for it, actually work for Kansas City. They don't run it like everyone else likes to run it, and when they do run it, everything is so meticulously designed to deceive and to make defenses fall prey to their own tendencies. And hell, even in the few instances where they do run these shovel passes the quote-unquote normal way, they'll do something very abnormal along with it so that they can still get away with it. Like, I don't know, making Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey pretend to be confused so the defense thinks that nobody knows what the play call is, and then all of a sudden they'll surprise snap it and run a normal shovel pass off a normal sprint out look with the pulling guard and all that typical stuff that we talked about earlier. Is the acting job even necessary to make this play work? I don't know, but it's fucking hilarious. And to me, that's what matters because, I mean, if you're going to call this play at this point with how low of a success rate it has, you at least need to do it in a different way to make it appear new and, you know, throw some style points in there while you can. Beyond all of that though, what really gets me the most about this is that whenever Kansas City finds a design that works, they never run it the same way twice. Even year over year, I'm talking over the span of a half decade, they'll do the same concept, sure, but never out of the same formation and never out of the same personnel grouping. Every single time they call a shovel pass, whether it's overhand, underhand, from the gun, under center, it does not matter. It is a self-contained, isolated incident that you will never, ever see on film again, so good luck preparing for it. If you want to know one of the main reasons why Andy Reid is a Hall of Fame coach, that is why. He can take an objectively, statistically bad play, tweak it over and over and over again, and somehow make it usable. In short, the man is just diabolical. All right, uh, hopefully this helped teach you guys something new today, including the history of the shovel option and why basically everybody sucks at running it. And maybe for some of you while you were watching this, the thought did cross your mind. You know, this episode seems exceptionally petty by Brett's standards. Is he the type of person that would take 70 hours of his life in almost two weeks and dedicate it just to making an episode solely that he can convince Zach Taylor to never call a particular play ever again as long as he lives? Is Brett that crazy? Yes, I am. Zach, please, for the love of God, call literally anything else. ISO into a 13-man box. Put Cordell Volson in the fucking Wildcat. I don't care. Call anything else. This isn't working. You're O of 3. And you know what? You're probably going to be O of 6 by the end of the year. Call anything else. It's time to stop. Your family is worried. Do something else. Alright, that's it.